Well, Ibu Patel was a tough act to follow. Uh, they needed to bring up four of us to do so. So let, let, even then, it's going to be a challenge. Uh, uh, my name is Peter Manso. I'm the curator of American religious history at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. And I'm also a product of interfaith engagement here at Georgetown. I'm a 2013 graduate of Georgetown's program in uh, religious pluralism. So thank you to Interfaith America and Georgetown for bringing me back here and uh, for having us here for this conversation. Well, following Ibu's inspiring remarks, uh, we wanted to take this opportunity to explore some dimensions of Interfaith America not just as a new chapter in, in an important organization, but as the idea that has brought us all together today. So we're going to discuss a little bit, what does Interfaith America mean in practice? As the curator of religion at the National Museum of American History, Interfaith America is, for me, first of all, a historical fact. The diversity of religious thought and traditions is not a recent development in the United States, but is among the most, among the original and most enduringly fundamental aspects of the American experience. From the beginning, we've been shaped by ongoing engagement of competing and conflicting religious beliefs and practices. This engagement has often been volatile. Sometimes it's been violent. Sometimes it's been inspiring. Always it's been mutually transformative. In a way, the story of America has always been the story of interfaith America. But interfaith America is not just a historical fact. It's also a present and active reality, a reality that exists and we experience in a number of dimensions. Uh, for the sake of this conversation today, I thought we'd focus on three of those dimensions, the cultural dimension, the communal dimension, and the legal dimension. And fortunately, Interfaith America has brought some wonderful conversation partners to explore those ways of thinking about Interfaith America. So I wanted to begin uh, with my Smithsonian colleagues, with Sabrina Lynn Motley, uh, to, to talk about the Smithsonian's engagement, engagement with in Interfaith America, specifically through uh, the Smithsonian Folklife Festival, of which you are the director. Yes. So um, first of all, thank you, Ibu, for bringing us all together. I have a sense that he just wanted to throw a party and gather his, his greatest friends, and you certainly have done that. Um, I have um, also, I have the honor of being on the steering committee for the interfaith, Black Interfaith Program. Um, so I have been um, both challenged and inspired by your work. To your, to your question, the Smithsonian Folklife Festival, for those of you who don't know it, um, started in 1967 as a sort of um, a way to ask who owns, who contributes to the American promise. Um, it is a question that we continue to ask. We take place every summer on the National Mall of the United States. It's the place where Martin Luther King called us to the beloved community. It's also the place where uh, January 6th, people gathered to march on the Capitol. It's that history that we carry with us every summer. Um, we bring practitioners, cultural practitioners, artisans, cooks together in what we call an exercise in cultural democracy. Faith has been part of our experience since the very beginning, whether it's songs, garments, ritual, um, we uh, hosted um, literally hundreds of Muslims after 9-11 that first summer. Um, we have had ancestral uh, practices. Really, we have had everything there in the mall. And the one thing that we haven't done is thought about it concretely. And this work that we're doing um, together with Ibu, Interfaith America, is calling us to think about the Folklife Festival, the Smithsonian, and how we can bring people together. Next year, we will host a program called um, Creative Encounters, Living Religions in the US. And it's a way for us to crystallize many of the things that you all have talked about today. And I hope that you will not only join us, but contribute to this work. Um, it speaks to, I think, the mission of the Smithsonian. It speaks to the compassion and possibility of an institution that um, is certainly much more than artifacts and collections. Um, and I hope that it also reflects 
the possibility of this country. So I, I'm really excited to be here. Um, I want to thank you again, and um, I want to also, you know, raise the flag for culture. Um, it has an important role to play. Yeah. Really, one of the really beautiful things about uh, about the National Mall and the Smithsonian that frames it is the way that it does bring together communities from all over the country and all around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and communities seem to be. Um, for many people, where this work of interfaith engagement began. Um, uh, planning, a, uh, planning charity works between your church and the synagogue next door. That, that, that way of interacting with people in your community who you may not meet with every weekend, but you do find a way, communities find a way to do that type of outreach. So I wanted to bring in uh, Rabbi Joshua Stanton from the East End Temple in, in New York uh, to speak a little bit about the community's role, religious community's role in the work of interfaith engagement. There are multiple dimensions that this role can take, and one of them relates to intra-religious pluralism. Another relates to pluralism as it plays out on our streets and in the public square. And then a third relates to families. I want to start with the familial aspect because the first thing I'm going to do after this extraordinary party that Ibu is throwing <laughs> is teach a class of intro to Judaism for people who are pursuing conversion. And what always comes up for those individuals is how do I show up in grief for my parent, for my sibling, who is Catholic or Muslim or Buddhist, now that I am trying to be Jewish. And my responsibility as someone who believes deeply in pluralism and also who is faithfully Jewish is to help them find their boundary and walk all the way out to the edge of that boundary to show up at the Catholic funeral for their mother of blessed memory, perhaps not to engage in all of the rites, but to be there fully with their families and then figure out what rituals they need Jewishly in order to feel whole inside. And then in the public square, I will say one of the best kept secrets and one, at a moment of great pain for the Jewish community, right as we were entering pandemic in December of 2019, January of 2020, there was a spate of anti-Semitic incidents in New York City. And what no one mentioned is that the organizers of key rallies in support of the Jewish community were Muslim. And that was testament to interfaith America itself. And they said to me, you showed up for us at key moments. We're here for you. So there I am trying to get sleep and relax as a rabbi at the turn of the year. And I'm getting calls from my Muslim colleagues saying, we are throwing a rally for you. You would better show up. <laughs> and that is interfaith America in the public square. And then perhaps the most difficult is interfaith America as I see it between Jews and between, within religious communities. Because I think we all know from experience the most painful rifts are familial. So how do I show up for a Satmar in Williamsburg when theologically and philosophically and in so many dimensions of my humanity, my life could not be more different? And I think one of the great challenges and opportunities is walking to the edge of our boundaries as they exist within our very particularistic microcosm and understanding what we have, what we have in common with other people who at least in name and in reality, share our faith. I don't want to miss the opportunity to uh, have you say a little bit about, um, so I did some research about all of you, of course, before we uh, joined today. Not guilty. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very interested in the story of how an evangelical pastor convinces someone to become a rabbi. So you're going to get me weepy. Ibu always gets me weepy. <laughs> but uh, the Reverend Dr. Paul Sorrentino, who is Director of Religious Life at Amherst College, is an essential reason that I am a rabbi today. And he saw that I was giving more and more of my time to the Jewish community. And his office was right next to a shared religious space, the Cadigan Center for Religious Life. And one Friday night, he was working late and I was spooning vegetables onto someone's plate at a Shabbat dinner. And he called me over and I was worried I was doing something wrong with my kitchen utensils or something. And he said, have you ever thought of being a rabbi? And I was kind of dumbstruck. It's not every day that an evangelical pastor asks a young Jewish student if they've considered becoming a rabbi. 
And after getting over my disbelief over a period of years, Paul has been an essential mentor for me. And from his standpoint, he was living out his faith to the fullest. Not just his job as director of religious life, but he was helping me find my faith. And from his standpoint, there could be nothing more Christian about it than bringing a young Jewish person into relationship with God and into relationship with religious life. And Paul remains a dear and beloved mentor. I spoke to him last week. And so this rabbi would not be here without an evangelical pastor. It's a wonderful story. I, I think that for so many of us, it, um, interfaith engagement begins with that uh, first person, very personal uh, interaction that opens up a whole new world for us. Uh, un unfortunately, we are often faced with these uh, cultural and communal expressions of, uh, of American religious life. Uh, they often need protection. Um, and so I, I wonder, I'd like to bring in uh, Monse Alvarado from the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty. Uh, to talk about the legal dimension of interfaith America. Is the law where, where the rubber meets the road in terms of religious interaction in America? You know, it's always fun when you start my introduction with unfortunately. Um, <laughs> it's a, it's a part of, because it is, because that's exactly what it is. It's so unfortunate that in this country, and for me as an immigrant, choosing this country as my country for this reason, because this American experiment and this young, young country got this thing right. This idea, I loved that phrase in the, in the prayer this morning, um, the, clash, the clash of ideas is the sound of freedom. Mm -hmm. Th that's why I do religious liberty work, because it's not about the answer. It's about being able to ask the questions and engaging with each other and having these conversations and having these interactions that further our faith journey. They further our closeness to God. And, and the reality is that without religion, religious liberty means nothing. If you don't have a literacy to understand your neighbor, to know how to be sensitive, but also how to bring them into deeper faith themselves, not because you're imposing what you believe, but because you're proposing a path and fostering and nurturing their path. And the law on paper protects that. On paper, our founders got that right. But in practice, we don't know each other, we don't value each other's humanity, and we're not furthering each other's human flourishing. That's the problem right now. The division and the polarization forces us into this unfortunate place where we are fighting in courts. Most of the time fighting governments, even more unfortunately sometimes fighting each other. And the inter, intra, um, both of those debates in the law are also painful. They're painful because we forget that these cases aren't just about two different ideas about where the country should go. They're about people's lives. And the stakes are really high because they're about people's lives. You raise a really good point, and it's something that echo, it echoes something Melissa said as well, that the, the interfaith work is hard. Uh, and it's, it's hard for good reason. If we were all just getting together and, and um, hoping for the best, it's, we wouldn't really um, affect change, right? So it's, how, do we, how, do we, um, how do you all, in your work, uh, deal with the competing needs and desires of uh, not just uh, the religious sphere against the secular sphere of the state, uh, but competing in conflicting religious needs sometimes. Um, how do we, how do we um, negotiate that in, in American society? I'm sure we're going to solve this right now. <laughs> Hopefully not through litigation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that should be the last resort, right? But through dialogue, through encountering each other, this incarnational reality that we have here, getting together and not waiting until you have a problem to develop the relationships in your community. Mm -hmm. That to me is part of the work that the Beckett Fund does is fostering that encounter, asking people to get to know each other before you have this, this moment of conflict. I wonder about rooting the conversation in the reality and belief of the individual. Um, there was a statistic that I heard recently that 65% of Americans are both pro-choice and pro-life. What that means is we are actually not listening to 65% of Americans because the conversation has been depicted in a way that ignores individual beliefs that get someone to that perspective. And so I just wonder about hearing the individual stories, hearing the individual perspectives, because the moment we move to ideological frameworks and catchphrases and slogans, we lose the humanity. Mm. It seems um, that's something that you know we try to do at the Folklife Festival, 
is foster that encounter. And in some ways, it reminds me of, you know, at least my definition of, of creativity. It's that place where grace and um, darshan, that sort of divine gaze, um, being present, um, and, and this notion of possibilities all collide. And that's part of the encounter. You know, you have to be present. You have to, it's, it's you know, when you, we're sitting close to each other and we're making something or we're eating something together. Um, we also, we often think that that's, those are really simple acts, but they're very nuanced and complex and filled, if they're done right, with compassion and, and connection. So I think we're all sort of floating in the same sea trying to make this place where people cannot turn away from each other but toward each other. I, I, we, we may have to have this conversation offline sometime, but working for the Smithsonian, an uh, instrumentality of the federal government, uh, how, how does that, how does uh, engaging with religion become complicated in that environment for you? Well, I think, you know, the, the mission of the Smithsonian is the increase and fusion of knowledge. Um, and so we have taken that and sort of run with it. Um, it's a very broad mission and um, religion, um, faith, ethics, um, are certainly part of that increase in diffusion of knowledge. And, you know, and the practice, the materials that come out of it, all of that is something that I think, again, the Smithsonian is in some ways duty bound to engage. And we've both been privileged to have the support of the Lilly Foundation and others who make that work possible. And fortunately, Lonnie Bunch, the secretary, sees that as an asset as well. Mm. So um, I see it as very much our sort of collective calling. Um, and, the, and while it's true, the federal part of the institution sometimes make that, makes that challenging, um, it doesn't make it impossible. Uh, the mission of Interfaith America as well, specifically the increase in diffusion of interfaith knowledge for the increase of religious literacy, which is what we all rely upon if we're ever going to find ways to, to live together. So I wonder if you could all just comment briefly, and this will probably be our last question, uh, what does the future of Interfaith America as an organization uh, mean to your work? How, how will you uh, look forward to engaging with Ibu and his colleagues? And um, what does the future look like for you? So Rabbi Jonah Pesner is here, and he is somebody who is a big believer in community organizing. And that means finding the unlikely ally. So who is the person who sits across the aisle from you, who disagrees with you about 99 out of 100 issues, with whom you can build a coalition about that one issue that is in common. And that, in my mind, is the essence of Interfaith America and the possibility of religious life in America. What are the coalitions that we can build? What is the good we can do together? How can we work together, even if we fundamentally disagree on a great deal? And who is not yet in this conversation? Who would be in the conversation if we were willing to meet them where they are? I think that um, for us in the religious freedom advocacy role, it's the religious literacy piece that you mentioned that's so important. If you think about all of the statistics out there, people don't understand what religion is, where it comes from, what the religious impulse looks like. Interfaith America puts that on display in a very human way, in a very genuine way. And that's critical because if you don't understand the religious person, if you don't believe that someone could have their gaze on the far horizon rather than just inward, then the reality is that you can't possibly understand how that manifests itself in daily life and how it needs to be protected or sometimes left alone mm -hmm. by government. So I'm very much looking forward to that engagement and to seeing this flourish. And I, I, I echo um, what you both said. I think sort of practically speaking, next year at the festival, we're working together. Um, on programming, and I hope that we, it is the start of a very long relationship where we learn together um, and that we bring people again together on the National Mall to explore uh, this Interfaith America in ways that they may not have thought. And I think that's going to be really, to me, the, the most wonderful thing if we can spark people's compassion and also their curiosity so when they go home, some of the things that you all are working with continue to feed them. Well, that seems like a good spot to leave that. So thank you again for having us, and we look forward to hearing the rest of the conversation. Thank you. Thank you.